was an interesting person to work with. He could be very stubborn and awkward, but he was very knowledgeable. I, I didn't. I never met him. Um, I don't think I did. And uh, but his had such a big impact on it because it was his his baby, um, and a lot of the recipes that are hanging around the beer names, um, they're all his. Uh, and he was a, a real master brewer. There's not many people who are master brewers, but he was one. I think he'd done 7,700 brews in his career. So that's a lot of beer. I've never added up how many pints it is, but it's an awful lot. I think when he started brewing, uh, he contacted HMRC to get a form to fill in, because when you brew, you pay duty on the beer. So if you produce something with alcohol in it, you have to pay duty on it. And they didn't even have a form. And at the time, there was only 80 breweries in England. There's about 3,000 breweries now. So it was a, a long time ago, 43 years ago, I think. Yeah, the marketplace is extremely tough. And people sometimes, because the marketplace is tough, it's a race to the bottom on price. So we're competing against people who are virtually giving it away. Uh, and the only way you can compete really is by the quality of what you produce. So if you've got a good quality product, you hope that the people will pay the price for it. Brewing is basically four ingredients. You've got um, water, malt, hops and yeast. And how those interact and what levels you choose of them and what temperatures you do determines the final product that you're after. Uh, we get all our malt from a malt company in Suffolk called Crisp Malt. The malt is barley, uh, which is grown in the field, it's harvested, and then it's taken to a maltings where they get it at the right temperature and with the right amount of moisture and trick the malt into thinking that it's been planted and is ready to start growing. And as soon as it grows, the energy that's stored inside that grain uh, turns to a starch so that it, the plant can use it as an energy source. We get all our hops from our hop factors in Worcestershire, Farrams, the uh, uh, majority of their hops are grown in Worcestershire and Herefordshire. Um, we use our own house yeast, which we reuse, um, and the water is, um, yeah, from the tap. Um, so you've got these four ingredients, and then you've got different stages of the process. So we're taking malted grains, so that's grains that have had the germination started and then stopped by kilning, and that locks in all the sugars, and we're basically extracting the sugars by the next stage, which is mashing, which is adding hot water, or in green, we call it liquor. So adding hot to that mash, extracting the sugars, because all the sugars will you know, get released out through enzymatic action. So there's different enzymes that are gonna release different sugars at different temperatures. Um, the next thing is getting the sugars and the juice, the wort, the wort out of the mash into the copper, which is basically a big uh, vessel where we boil up that wort that we've collected. Um, we'll be sparging through, uh, which basically is spraying water on the top of the grain, which will wash out those sugars in there and give us a bit more volume in the copper. We'll be adding hops at the beginning, um, which add bitterness, and towards the end of the boil, which is an hour, uh, we'll be adding some more, and that's aroma um, and flavour. Um, after that, we'll leave it to stand for a little bit in the hops, and then we'll draw off that work and rapidly cool it through a plate heat exchanger so we can take it into the fermenting vessel fermenter and we'll be oxygenating that and adding yeast in there as well uh, the yeast is a massive flavor component um, and with the ales it's a top cropping uh, yeast so it'll ferment from the top so you'll see it all bubbly on top and it kicks out uh, carbon dioxide and during that process it will kick out um, alcohol as well as it eats the sugars that we've, we've given it so it's got nice um, maltose to munch on, a bit of oxygen to keep it, get it going and then it'll just get to work replicating, eating those sugars, kicking out alcohol and bringing the levels of sugar down. Every single part of the process whether it's temperature of the mash, temperature of the fermentation, um, length of boil, amount of hops, variety of hops, types of malt, or everything is, um, it's a bit like um, open for interpretation. So you can, depend on what kind of beer you want at the end and what flavors you want and what profile you want at the end, all those things can be changed. And to do a consistent, like core range beer, for example, you're trying to keep those things the same every single time um, based around those products. Um, 
so yeah that's that's the basic thing for the brewing part of it once it's had its fermentation we'll cool it put it into cask and then a really important part of the process is it stays in the cask for another week and it does a secondary fermentation because there's still a little bit of yeast in there a little bit of oxygen um, and that'll give the cask its sort of life and it'll help melt those flavors together a bit so conditioning time before it then gets delivered to the pub and hopefully they look after it and it comes through into a nice clean glass through nice clean lines and it is fantastic and delicious um, so yeah once we've um finished with that grain we've got no further use for it um, but any waste companies um, charge you on weight um, and so we'll be looking at about a ton of waste every time so uh, we've got a local farmer in Middleton who comes and collects that grain it's all um, registered with the council through their services so they can it's full traceability uh, but he'll come and take our grain away and he feeds it to his beef cattle and sheep okay so um, we're standing, in, well, sitting in the, I'm sitting, uh, in a room that used to be lots of offices uh, and downstairs used to be two rooms of offices. Uh, and, and now we've got one person with a computer that can do all the work that was done by people, um, that, by numerous people. So we've got this empty space that we needed to use as a resource. Tony had collected a lot of um, brewery memorabilia. We're gonna sort of decorate the bars with that and that'll be a big talking point for people. Um, it's nice for me, I like the fact that I'm working in an industry that's got um, a lot of history to it. You know, beer's been made in the similar way to the way we make it, you know, for five, six, seven hundred years in this country. And to be part of that continuing tradition of making cask ale is kind of a uniquely British kind of thing, which is quite, uh, quite a fun thing to think about at the end of the day when you think about your job. I guess the idea for the brewery tap was uh, I suppose the three of us, myself and my two daughters, Vex and Lucy. Uh, and we've always, since we first ever visited the brewery, which is probably about 10 years ago, we always thought it'd be marvellous to have a tap here. I don't think there were any existing plans. At that time, um, there were a lot more pubs. I mean, I think there's on average three pubs closing down every week at the moment, um, because that's not where people want to be, you know. Um, it's been taxed heavily, so it's got relatively more expensive in relation to people's income. Um, so we have to look what, how those people are drinking and when they're drinking. They're drinking at home, drinking at weekends. Um, so that's why we've gone to the bottling, really, to try and even up the loss of pubs with getting a new market somewhere. It's something that so many breweries do now so that you get immediate feedback on your beer. You know, you're selling your beer, so you, you've got another income stream, the, the money's coming straight to us. Um, but you've also got instant feedback on the beers that people like. Um, and then we've got a room here that can be used for meetings, bigger gatherings, and two, and two rooms downstairs that can be used as um, rooms to the bar. So yeah, hopefully we'll have a, a bar here. It'll be a community resource. People can rent this room and uh, they can do Pilates, yoga, or they can just have their, their club meetings here or whatever they want to do and there's a bar downstairs for them. So hopefully we'll um, act as a bit of a community hub as well, a bit of community cohesion. So yeah, I think I'm looking forward to it, it's all positive. <music>